Okay, guys. Um, welcome to my talk. Um, nice to meet you all. My name is Richard. I'm Richard Ventel. I'm from Amsterdam, uh, the Netherlands. And would first like to say a very big thank you to all the people of the organization uh, of India GDC. Um, I'm honored to attend, and, and thank you guys for attending my uh, session. So, uh, a little bit about me. Amongst other things, I'm a researcher, educator, a designer uh, at the HKU University of the Arts, uh, Utrecht, in the Netherlands. And I actually work at two faculties, uh, the School of Games, as well as the School of Music and Technology. And this is also where my background is. I'm a music and technologist, um, but I have a background in creative design practices, uh, sonic interaction design, game audio, applied game design, and accessibility. I also run a two-person studio in Amsterdam called Creative Heroes. Um, we design uh, things such as apps, games, and sometimes really weird or um, exotic stuff. So we once launched uh, a set of applied dice, uh, amongst other things. We also run audiogames.net, which is uh, one of the leading uh, platforms for blind gamers, and we've been doing that for over 20 years now. I've also been part of the uh, IGDA Game Accessibility Special Interest Group since 2006, and this uh, SIG is advocating for accessib more accessibility in games. We've been formulating uh, industry guidelines, and now, for a few times, I already mentioned the word accessibility. And to understand what I mean with accessibility, I have a clip of Ian Hamilton uh, explaining it. So is there sound? In the room, can have some kind of a guess about what this gentleman's disability is? So what the thing is that's actually causing him to be disabled? So you might be thinking, perhaps he has cerebral palsy. In which case, you have guessed correctly in that he does have cerebral palsy. However, cerebral palsy is not actually a disability. Cerebral palsy is a medical condition. It's a very important distinction to make. So what else then? You might be thinking about the fact that he is in a wheelchair. But a wheelchair is just like a pair of glasses, you know? It's a piece of assistive technology that allows him to go about his day. And he was going about his day just fine until he tried to meet his friends in that bar. And that's when he encountered the steps. And that's what disability is. It's stuff like those steps. It's when someone's medical condition encounters some kind of a barrier which results in difficulty performing a day-to-day -day task. And these kind of barriers, whether it's steps in front of a bar, whether it's a shelf that's too high, whether it's the red team versus green team in deathmatch, these kind of barriers are so often put there by another person. You know, someone designed it to be like that. Which is a bit of a heavy thing to get your head around that as designers, as developers, we actually cause people to be disabled. But there is, of course, the flip side to that, which is that by being aware of what kind of barriers can be present, we can remove those barriers, avoid those barriers, and actually prevent these disabling situations from occurring. And it's that process that's known as accessibility. Thank you, Ian. Um, so personally, I've mostly been interested and involved in uh, blind accessible gaming. And here are some statistics. Um, so there's an estimated 23 uh, million visually impaired gamers worldwide. And personally, I think this really is a staggering number. Um, but it's also a huge market when you think of it. So you might be wondering, so what games are being played right now by this community of gamers? Uh, well, for a long time, blind gamers have had access to text-based games. Think of classic text adventures such as Zork. And these are accessible via um, devices such as uh, braille readers, screen reader software, uh, text-to-speech software. And it's quite interesting to see that with the rise of AI, there are now also more uh, interesting examples, such as AI Dungeon. Um, so there's actually quite a few uh, text-based games out there. And uh, some visually impaired gamers, especially the older ones, they, they really like them for their classic uh, gaming experience. 
whereas uh, many of uh, younger gamers, they really find these games somewhat old-fashioned and dated, and they prefer to be included in the cool PlayStation games that they know from their friends or their relatives. Um, so, uh, there are some gamers who uh, will try and play these cool PlayStation mainstream video games, either together with friends or family or alone, and some are even able to, to master such video games. And in these cases, the, the games are not specifically designed to be accessible, but they are um, uh, accessible through their rich audio design that allow the players to play the game. But it often involves a lot of hard work and perseverance from the player. And unfortunately, it only goes for, um, there are only a few titles out there. Um, then um, there's a small but growing number of mainstream games um, which have intentional accessibility features that allow visually impaired gamers to, to play them. And some recent examples uh, include The Last of Us, uh, Part 2, and uh, Forza Motorsport. And um, I really think that these bars, uh, these these uh, games really raise the bar of uh, accessible game design. Um, the, the bad thing is there's really too few of them, but they're really promising. Um, and then there's audio games or sound-only games. And audio games are not specifically games for the blind, but they're really niche and uh, obscure, uh, often to, to non-visually impaired gamers. And uh, there might even be some people in this room uh, today who never knew of their existence. Is that so? Have any of you played an audio game? Really no one. Um, <laughs> so the number of audio games um, is fortunately rising. So we have over 850 audio games in our uh, audiogames.net database. And recently there have been some really high quality audio game releases on, on Switch, on the Xbox, on Steam. Um, unfortunately, the quality of the majority of the games in our database is still uh, relatively low. And this is partly due to the fact that um, many titles are already quite old, uh, have become abandonware. Um, many of these games are created by either hobbyists or indie developers uh, with very limited resources. And sometimes, uh, well, the gameplay of such games is also very limited. Uh, quite a few audio games are actually based on existing video games uh, or board games, um, and therefore they lack a certain originality. And um, that becomes very painful when you look at how expensive audio games uh, sometimes are. So when you're spending 40 bucks on, I know, Dark Souls or Uncharted, uh, adult blind gamers were spending 40 bucks on accessible Yahtzee, a memory. Um, and here's a cynical example of these issues created by Liam Irvin, who's also a blind audio game developer. It's this summer's hottest accessible game release. <coughs> this is Commander Crap. Uh, listen up. Uh, uh, there's a bunch of aliens trying to kill you. Use your space bar to kill them. Because that's what you have to do with this game. That's right, it's this summer's hottest release. Beep. You don't have to know any fancy keystrokes. In fact, you don't really have to do much of anything. You just sit there when you hear the beep. Press your space bar. Here's a sample of the game. Oh, I am dead. I have been shot. Oh, you got me. Ow, I am a dead alien. That's right. It's Beep, the only game that proves that blind people will buy just about anything. If you'd like to buy a copy of this exciting game, send $20 PayPal to Liam at l-works.net. That's Liam, L-I-A-M, at l-works.net. And we'll ship you a copy as soon as we feel like it. Yeah. Um, so I've been involved in audio games for a really long time, and there are several reasons for that. Uh, on one end, as a designer, um, I really like some of the challenge that you uh, encounter um, wh when you deal with accessible design. So I think it makes me a better designer. Uh, but more importantly, um, as a human being, as an ethical designer, I truly believe 
everybody deserves to save the universe. Uh, there's literally millions of gamers out there who want to play high quality games, who need to play high quality games, and who deserve access to meaningful game experiences just like the rest of us. So, uh, today I'd like to share some of what I learned from uh, doing audio games, playing audio games, researching, teaching audio games, um, so that after this session, hopefully, you'll be inspired and you will start incorporating um, accessibility features uh, into your own projects or even decide to start your own audio game project or company. Um, so I'm going to do that. Um, I'm going to, to, to talk about walls and in specifically the sound of walls. Um, and there's this really interesting thing about the sound of walls and maybe you can guess that is walls don't sound. Right? Um, so let's use an example. Imagine one day Stevie comes up to you and he says he's got this brilliant idea uh, for an audio game and he wants you to design and build it and he offers you a couple of thousand Bitcoin uh, in return. So here's his uh, concept. Uh, you play this person who is stuck in an old abandoned warehouse, uh, but it's actually not abandoned at all uh, since it's run over by chocolate zombies and they're trying to eat you. Um, Luckily, you have this amazing weapon. It's called a flame mask, and it's actually like this head-mounted flamethrower thingy, and it's really effective, um, melting all the chocolate zombies. There is, however, one catch. You can't see anything through the mask, so you're playing blind. Uh, the goal of the game is to find your way out of the warehouse, through the various rooms and hallways, while staying alive. Would you take this job? I would, a couple of thousand bitcoins. Um, so if you were to say yes, and you would start developing this audio game, at some point, you would maybe run into a wall. Why is that? Walls are hard. They're hard to design in an audio game, and that's because they don't sound. Um, so here's a question for you. How would you approach this design challenge? I have selected uh, four options from existing audio game designs and you don't need to raise your hand or anything, you just think about what would you do. Are there any designers here? Couple? Okay, so even if you're not a designer. So the first option would be uh, that you just don't want to deal with the problem or you just want to avoid it. Um, the second option is to implement some kind of echolocation feature. Uh, so the avatar um, uh, could produce some kind of sound like a and, and, and then the reverberations would indicate uh, where the walls would be. Um, the third option is to have your character wear these fancy virtual smart shoes. So these shoes would have some kind of sensors and whenever a wall would be near you'd hear this subtle beep 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 beep, beep sound to indicate that you're nearing a wall. And the fourth and final option would be music walls. So you just design the walls to make sound or music. Stevie Wonder walls. Uh, so you can <laughs> simply listen to know where they are. Um, okay, there might be more options. Um, let's stick with these four, to four, four today. So which one would you pick? Okay, hold your thought for a moment. Um, and I'm going to jump to a related subject now and talk about adapting games. And I do this because the strategies for adapting games provide, I think, valuable insights for designing audio games and I want to share those uh, with you. Uh, so looking at this picture, I think you can guess what game is being played here. Anyone? Jenga! Yeah. Okay, so for those who thought uh, Jenga, you're right. Uh, a good friend of mine sent me this uh, uh, picture of his colleagues playing Jenga or improvised Jenga during an uh, office relocation. And when I saw it, I immediately asked his permission to use it in my slides because um, for me it exemplified uh, uh, an, uh, a quote by uh, ludologist Jasper Jewell. 
And this is the quote. Games are a transmedial phenomena. As we have seen in the, the previous session, uh, games can exist in a wide variety of different media, in pixels or in cardboard, but games can also be adapted uh, between different media. Uh, so take for example chess, uh, it exists in wood and paint and but it's, you can also play it with humans and horses, uh, you can also play chess with stuff you found on the beach, you can also play chess in World of Warcraft and you can even play chess using chocolate. Um, so the concept of chess seems to adapt or work quite well in a variety of uh, physical and digital media. Now the thing is, some game concepts work really well in a sound-only media, medium, and some don't. So how can you tell if, for instance, uh, Stevie's audio game concept is a good one? How can you tell? Um, enter Scott Kim. If you don't know him, he's quite a legendary puzzle designer. He's also one of the two inventors of the ambigram. The ambigram is the, the little thing underneath his, uh, his picture. If you turn your head, you can still read Kim. Um, in the late 1990s, Kim was confronted with many physical puzzles being um, adapted to, to the being adapted digitally to computers. And uh, he found that it not always didn't work out well. And so he shared his insights and a set of five heuristics or five steps in a lecture called uh, Paper Plays paper, plastic, or PlayStation at Stanford. And so I'll be using Scott's five steps uh, of adapting games between media, more or less uh, for a framework for designing audio games. So the first step, uh, or the first heuristic, is know no, uh, the medium. Um, now this is a four-year course <laughs> at uh, the School of Music and Technology, so I really need to be brief. Um, Here's the short version. When you look at the material of sound, there's all these properties. It exists in time, it's generally omnidirectional, there's a high resolution, it's pretty good for communication, it's excellent with other media, etc., etc., etc. So, um, uh, w when you look at what, what does it afford, um, it's great for expressing meaning, it's great at expressing uh, changes. Um, you can create uh, excellent settings uh, with sound. It supports interaction and, and, and this one I think is pretty important. It's really good at stimulating the imagination. However, there are also some uh, limitations to the material of sound. Uh, it's it's, it takes time, uh, it's somewhat limited at conveying multiple messages at once. Uh, ask yourself how many conversations uh, yesterday at the mixer could you listen to simultaneously? Um, it can unnecessarily uh, drive too much attention, or draw too much attention. It has a lower spatial resolution compared to visuals. And not everything sounds, such as walls. So it's, it's relatively slow for providing overviews. It needs professional design attention. If you're doing sound, you really need to use sound audio professionals. It's not that fit that to constantly display static information. Somehow it works and feels best in the first person. They have to really work harder to refer to things that don't sound. Um, Side note, I'm well aware that I now only focus on the material of sound, the output medium, and not stuff like input controllers, uh, which are also important. But I'll leave those out of my uh, the equation for now. So, uh, Scott says, um, ask yourself, uh, for both media, what do you give up, uh, what stays the same, and what do you gain? And I did this experiment using the properties uh, I wrote down. And this is completely non-scientific. This is just a brain dump uh, of some of the properties. But while I was doing this and I was playing around, um, something dawned on me. And, um, and that is that the balance between uh, the possibilities of visuals and sound. It seems that if you're trying to adapt a visual uh, game to a sound-only game, there is a chance that you give up more than what you gain. Um, of course, I need to pursue this uh, 
into a more depth investigation. Uh, and it heavily depends on the type of game that you're adapting. And that actually is the second step. Choose the right game. Uh, how many are familiar with Echo Chrome? PlayStation 2, a couple of two people. Um, I figured so much. <laughs> so uh, you guys all know this one, right? Monument Valley. So let's say you want to adapt Monument Valley into an audio game. How would you do that? Ask yourself, so, so what is Monument Valley's gameplay actually about? It's okay, there's a narrative, there's a story, but there's also this puzzle and this broken architecture with optical illusions. Do you think that perhaps sonic illusions such as the shepherd tone could be used in a similar fashion? I personally think that if you were to adapt this particular game, to a sound-only game, to an audio game, maybe aside from the narrative, it would be really, really hard. And you would probably end up designing something completely different. Uh, Pong, on the other hand, it's a game that has been adapted to, uh, uh, to audio games many, many times already. Uh, also in many varieties, multiple perspectives, first person, third person, top down. Uh, uh, the, uh, perspective from the pedal, perspective from the ball, etc. And, and there's something in this very, very simple game, the simplicity, the, the maybe the hand-eye or the ear-eye coordination, the single focus on, on, on getting the pedal and the ball uh, uh, correctly. It's something about it, it's easily transferable to sound. Now I want to share uh, one of my projects. Uh, this morning I was talking to Jake <laughs> and he mentioned, yeah, I used to work in Flash and Director. This is also made in Micromedia Director. Uh, so way back when Sudoku became popular, there were many gamers on uh, audiogames.net uh, on our forum and they wanted to know, okay, so what is this Sudoku all about? So as an experiment, we created an online version of Sudoku called uh, Sudosan. And it had an extensive sonic interface. Uh, we also added a, a visual interface just because we could and we want to try some stuff out. Um, but you could play this uh, with the screen turned off, with your eyes closed, etc. And to play, um, players um, would use the cursor keys to navigate around the puzzle, and there were keys to hear each row or column or square or even the candidates that would be in the cells. Um, and this experiment <laughs> was really a huge success in the sense that our design was an absolute disaster. Um, and although th 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 there were many visually impaired gamers on a platform that said, well, we applaud your efforts and now I understand what Sudoku is a little bit about, but it sucks. <laughs> And it's, it's, it's too time-consuming, it's too cognitive, and it really feels like work. Um, well, what we realized uh, is that there's this aspect to Sudoku that is very visual, uh, that you instantly see relations between numbers, which is very complicated to do in sound. So we could have started with a smaller puzzle, like 4x4 four four or 6x6, six six. Um, but maybe Sudoku <laughs> is not a really good choice to begin with. It was a really cool experiment. Um, the, f the third step is avoid what's hard. Do you remember? Walls are hard. So just avoid them. Please know this was not a trick question. I, I could make a case for any of the four options. Uh, it depends on the game, etc. But I want to use this specific angle um, using a Dutch saying. So the Dutch saying is like sommige problemen los je op door er geen probleem van te maken. Which roughly translates to some problems are solved by not making them into a problem. Um, and if you paid attention, it's literally what Ian mentioned while explaining accessibility. So I want to have you listen to the clip once more. Like that. 
which is a bit of a heavy thing to get your head around that as designers, as developers, we actually cause people to be disabled. But there is, of course, the flip side to that, which is that by being aware of what kind of barriers can be present, we can remove those barriers, avoid those barriers, and actually prevent these disabling situations from occurring. And it's that process that's known as accessibility. Um, I was once involved in a horror audio game project called Dark. Uh, in this game, the, the player would walk around in some kind of hellscape environment. And here's a schematic of uh, one of the level designs. The goal of the game uh, was to get to certain checkpoints uh, to progress the story and, and while avoiding and, and shooting monsters. So one of the, the novelties of our designs was um, directional listening. And we called it a sonic visor. So, so you could only hear what's in front of you with a certain spread and a, a certain range. Um, and in this game, uh, we also had walls uh, in order to constrain the player inside the, the rectangular play area. Uh, we also wanted some, some buildings for the player to go inside and outside. Uh, and we too ran into the problem of the walls. And our initial solution was to use the sonic visor as some kind of white cane. I don't know if you have those in, in India, the, the white canes that the blind people use. Yeah. Um, uh, so every time the sonic visor, uh, they would touch a wall, uh, there would be this subtle sa scraping sound, like... <laughs> so you know there's a wall there, and you could turn around, you move in the other direction. But when we playtested it and playtested it, it was really a disaster. It really didn't work. Players would get stuck into the corners and inside the walls, <laughs> and the subtle <laughs> would turn into a... <laughs> <laughs> and everything was... Sorry for that. Um... So this is the solution we came up with, by just avoiding the problem. So instead of having a rectangular play area, we made it globular. Uh, same for the building, so we changed the architecture. So you could just enter a building from any direction, uh, and you'd have this amazing sonic transient really transporting you from the outside to the inside. And it worked really well. And actually, so what we did here was something I call, or actually what is called, to take artistic license, which I believe any good designer dares to do. And it's, it, it means that as a designer you intentionally try to break idioms, conventions, maybe even realism or accuracy for the sake of a better, more interesting or fun design. And game designers have been doing this for decades already, of course. So for instance, the double jump, maybe at first such a mechanic seemed really absurd, but now we consider it just to be quite normal. So avoid what's hard. The fourth step is keep what's essential. So um, uh, you should ask yourself what stays the same? What is the intended core experience of the game you're trying to adapt? What is the core experience of your audio game concept? And to explain core experiences, they can literally be anything. Um, but they're often the main reason the players want to play your game. And there are quite a few models out there. Here's one intimidating one by Frans Mayra. Uh, so let's uh, simplify it a little bit. So in this particular model, it describes three ways of achieving uh, player gratification. Uh, one is via the senses. Uh, you want to play a game for its beautiful visuals or uh, its sounds. One is via challenge. You want to play the game to win, to break the, to break the high score. Uh, and one is what Franz calls uh, imagination. Uh, you play the game to get to know all of the story, its characters, its lore, maybe its culture. Um, some games focus uh, on one, other games uh, focus uh, on, on all of them. And this, of course, is quite generic. And as a designer, you need to do a dive a little bit deeper, so how do you achieve that uh, in your concept? Well, looking at Sudoku, the gratification uh, is obviously in finally solving the puzzle. But at its core, the puzzle maybe is really about being able to recognize the useful patterns between the numbers that help you reach this goal. So it's not the numbers themselves, it's the invisible relationships between them that become visible for, th for the player through their efforts. Um, in our prototype Dark, uh, the intended core experience was all about experiencing a perilous 
story of survival, and it was never ever about navigating walls. Um, so I think this should really be one of your holy grails uh, of audio game design. Uh, finding and focusing on the intended core experience. Uh, last but not least, at what is possible. Um, um, oh, I'm sorry, at what is possible. So you should ask yourself, okay, so if I were to design a game in sound only, what is unique to the medium and how can that add to the game? And while looking at the properties of sound and having played many, many games, um, uh, audio games, um, I think this is one of the most important ones. Sound is quite fit for stimulating imagination. So like books and, and audio drama, audio games are truly interactive catalysts for the imagination. And therefore it's no wonder that one of the, some of the recent examples of high quality audio games uh, that were released on Switch and Xbox and Steam, they lean very heavily on narrative and environmental storytelling, even in a racing game. Um, so I'm wrapping up and then <laughs> I'm within time. So um, I guess you could say bad audio game designs often rely to uh, too much on existing video game concepts or paradigms and this results in the focus um, that the focus shifts too much to making uh, their old visual surface forms accessible and then there's too little focus on the core experience and this leads to too many workarounds which eventually result in boring or difficult game experiences. Um, so here are my heuristics for audio game design. Take the strength and strengths and weaknesses of the medium uh, of sound into account. Uh, focus on the core experience. Try to afford player imagination as much as possible. And finally, please take artistic license as many as possible whenever you run into a wall. Thanks. <laughs> Do you want to use my microphone? Yeah, okay. No, I think that was the thank you. <laughs> so I don't have to say it. Okay. <laughs> but thank you so much. Yeah. That was... Uh, well, thank you. I think, like you can see, everyone's dying to ask questions. I'm not going to take any of that time. Uh, we have limited time for question and answers. So please throw your questions as, as soon as you can. Hi. Yeah. Hi, Richard. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I think it's a great topic to be discussed more about. Mm -hmm. uh, my question to you is with regards to publishing these kind of games. Yes. Uh, sure, there are challenges like you had to build a website which will have to uh, uh, like hop on to play and experience these games. What's the potential that you see in terms of making these uh, more accessible to people so that they can explore these games? So yeah. instead of them, okay, I'll repeat could, my question. Could you re repeat your question one more time because there was a crackle in the. Yeah, okay. So my question is like with respect to making these games more accessible to everyone. Yes. What's the challenge or what insights have you uh, figured out? Uh, so, for example, as of now, they have to go to a website and play the game. Uh, but no, is there. No. Okay. So, is no. there like any other uh, format, for example, through home devices or earpods where these games can be made easily accessible to more and more people so they can explore and see? Uh, the the quality that, uh, of experience that it, it can build uh, bring to them. Yeah, the, I, I think your if I understand your question correctly, thank you. Um, there, there are multiple layers in your question. So one is the technical side. Uh, audio games are being built using all kinds of technology. So Unity, Unreal, uh, Game Maker, maybe even. Um, I used to use Director and Flash for audio games. So, um, and actually there, and using those tools, you can distribute your games to multiple platforms. So uh, online, I, I know there's some, some uh, web audio based audio games. Um, uh, there are games on, on Switch and Xbox, etc. So on the technical side, there's the, but, but if I understand the second part of your question correctly, it's about how do you let people know that there's, there's a thing called audio games? Uh, well, it's advocacy like this. Um, 
I uh, there are there are some uh, with with the uh, rise of mobile gaming. Um, mobile phones are, are 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 a device that are really well suited for audio games because and and that's actually why why I tend to show this picture. Oh, it doesn't show anymore. Well, with the guy uh, with his eyes closed in public transport for holding his phone, and um, those are actually uh, the, the kind of context and the types of platforms that already have a lot, lot of coverage. Uh, and there, there's a big rise in mobile audio games already, or a significant rise. Uh, um, so I think um, then you run into um, well other issues of just promoting your games. However, there's this thing about audio games that every once in a while there's a platform like Edge Magazine or Kotaku or they're like, oh, now there's this new novel thing, audio games. And that also uh, gets promotion. Other than that, I wouldn't know. Okay, I mean, so do you see the potential of using home devices for games like these, uh, like Alexa and yeah. Google Home and all that? Yeah, actually there are some. Uh, on there. Um, I don't have any experience with it. I know there are at least two audio games on Alexa. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Hello, Richard. Uh, great presentation. I just wanted to um, ask you, uh, in, in your presentation, there was a slide where you were showing uh, your colleagues playing Jenga. And beside that, there was a quote that games are Oh, the, the quote, huh. games are a transmedial phenomena. So what, just a little elaboration on that, what does that uh, quote and that word means to you? Um, well, it's actually on the slides afterwards. Mm. Um, uh, um, there are all types of games. Um, and even when you, you when you go back here at um, uh, uh, so pre computer games um, maybe even pre uh, board games uh, maybe even back to the homo ludens uh, the people as playful creatures as all types of games and w when you look at the history we use all types of of media for that and um, so um, yeah you should probably read the, the paper from which I quoted it from Jasper Jewell. Um, uh, but it's uh, for me, uh, it means that as designers, we have amazing possibilities to design games with so many materials that are present. And, and this, in this particular um, talk, I focus on the material of sound. Um, but yeah, as a designer, I'm I'm pretty inspired to well to design chocolate games, and actually there have been game designers who did. So that is what the quote means for me. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Hi. Hi. So interesting presentation. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I had you. a question where. Um, like, what would be our approach where you have been tasked with the, uh, the whole thing where you have to design like a very visual heavy game? For example, you have hidden objects game yes. where it relies like completely on finding clues. And if like the very direct thing would be to just find or number the clues like this is the glass bottle or uh -huh. this is a cup. But then that takes away from the main objective of the game. So how would you... Like oh. in general design yeah. games. Yeah, actually, the, there's uh, the, um, uh, the I've been involved in a student project that tried to do this, um, and she coined the term muisteren, in, and this is this is a Dutch combination of the word luisteren, meaning listen, and using a mouse. <laughs> so maybe mousening or something. So moving the mouse around. So one of the approaches that she took was using a, a, a specific input device, which I didn't really cover in this specific talk. Um, and then if it becomes way too easy, uh, you could use uh, stuff like the, the cocktail party effect, uh, which in turn is again something you really need to know about sound. But um, uh, it is um, 
uh, if you have only one layer of sound, it you can pick out the sound really, really easily. But then if you were to add multiple layers of sound, it would become much harder. And then if you add another layer of sound that pops up sometimes, so if there's a glass break if a glass breaks right now, everybody's like, huh? What's over there? So then you draw the attention away from the focal, the auditory focal point from the player. So I would try stuff like that. Yeah. Hi. Th thanks for the presentation. Hey. hey. That was uh, really informative. I uh, have a question regarding uh, a narrative side of things. Yes. For example, uh, there's a phrase in filmmaking many of you would have known, and in video games as well. It's called show don't tell. Yes. So like. Uh, where instead of just dumping lots of exposition on the player on what's exactly happening around them, we either like show it to them visually or we uh, tell them in a specific way that it sort of remains abstract but it's kind of left in the imagination of the player or the viewer. Uh, in uh, like mediums with only like uh, one sense, for example books we are only reading yes. and audio games we are only listening so there's only one sense available to us. How can we leverage the imagination of the player and the amount of artistic licenses that we use without disrespecting the intelligence of the player while they're only having one um, sense to figure it all out. Mm, yeah, there seems to be an assumption in your question that if you use creative license that you're disrespecting the no, intellect uh, of the player. I mean, uh, oh. the, uh, my question was, uh, sorry, I should have rephrased that. My question was, uh, how, what, uh, how can we like get rid of those challenges where we like convey information to the player yes. in a way which is not on their face, even if they have only one sense to deal with, uh, while keeping the imaginative how part intact? How can you do intact? show and sound? Uh, or, or sound, not tell? Yeah. Um, well, I think when you... When you um, maybe look at movies and, and, and music and sound design uh, yep. for movies, a lot of the show don't tell is done uh, with sound as well. Yes. So there's the, there's the forecasting with the sound, uh, w even though there's nothing to see. Um, so sound already does those things. So they imagine, uh, um, uh, for instance, uh, uh, the the Sudoku game, I'm improvising right now, but the Sudoku game, and you were to move the cursor to a certain cell uh, th that you could not already fill in, yeah. you could maybe have foreshadowing uh, uh, in, in such a sense. So you would feel, okay, maybe this is not going right, but I don't know. And you could make it not obvious, you could make it um, uh, specifically using music. Music is a um, is a symbolic reference system actually. So um, uh, uh, you could have the player feel <laughs> uh, okay. where things could be going, but you're not literally telling them correct. Okay. Yeah. Although one of the big problems in audio games is that quite often there's not sufficient clear feedback. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I hope it answers. Otherwise, we can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk later. Thank you so yeah. much. Good question.